Welcome to another episode of Turek Books. We have with us today a guest I'm very excited to introduce to you. He's an activist, a comedian. You've probably seen him doing the good fight in front of many city councils around the country. Has his own show on Netflix, Chad and JT Go Deep. JT Parr. Oh, what's up, dude? Stoked to be here. Thank you for having me. I feel like uh, when I watch you, you're probably a very well-read person in disguise. You know, sometimes people will say that. I think that's that's the best way for me to appear. Like, because if I try to be smart, people get annoyed quickly. But if I try to be dumb and I'm accidentally smart, people find that charming. Yeah, I got lost in that. Even as you were saying it, I was like, <laughs> "Damn, he did it to me." I got well, fooled by another one. Yeah. No, no, I think you're spot on, and I, it's like that spoonful of sugar to make the medicine go down. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, yeah, you and I have known each other for a really long time, casually, you know. Yeah, I don't know like, if we've ever hung out one on one, but I, I but no. and I've run into you so much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I remember the conversations we had. Me too. I remember you and I were hanging out at that Carney's hot dog place on Sunset. Mm-hmm. It looks kind of like a train car, and the food was really cheap. I, is it still there? Yeah, and the food's really good. It's too. good, and the hours are nice if you're up late. Yeah, yeah. So I remember that. Um, yeah, I, I you know what I. I brought this, so every Christmas I get my girlfriend like a few coffee table books at Skylight Books, one or two, usually things more in line with her, but I took a risk a couple Christmases ago and got her this book that I feel like was really more for me, but I think you'd appreciate it. It's uh, called American Bachelor. Oh, that's sick. And it's like a document of bachelor life in like the early 2000s. This is before the sort of social media, like um, hyper self-awareness or fear of being canceled or whatever came out. And so it's just like this real fascinating time capsule of like kind of sincere bros. I don't know, flip it open. And they're not playing look. into it. They're, they're not just, playing into it. This is this is who you would almost make jokes about now. But um, yeah, see, that's awesome. Oh, this is making me so nostalgic. So nostalgic, right? Yeah, because this is when I got out of high school, and there was nothing ironic about this lifestyle. This is just who men were at the time, which was like this whole toxic brew of sort of masculinity moving in, moving into like, um, you know, yeah, I guess self awareness, adulthood. adulthood but not quite there yet. I think there was also something nice about before social media, like you didn't know how unattractive you were because you didn't see every good looking person in the world. So you could kind of pretend that you were like pretty hot, you like know, whatever your mom told you about yourself last. Was yeah, kind exactly. Of what you could run with. Yeah, dude, to that, like I, I moved in with my mom for a little bit during COVID. My self esteem's never been higher. Like oh. every day my mom was like, God, you are just a smoke show, man. And I was like, let's go. Dude. It's just gassing you up. <laughs> for sure. Oh my God. That's well, you know, it's good. I'd, I'd rather have like the delusionally optimistic mom about totally you than the the other way around yeah because i think you, you fake it till you make it a little bit too like if, if you believe it deep enough the rest of the world but see social media won't allow that but like if it was just interpersonal you can convince those people a little bit oh absolutely this you talking about that era also reminds me like when you're at, at that point when someone took a picture of you you like would be so thrilled if you ever saw the photo yeah like if they came if you if they came back into your life with the printed out photo and you're like oh my god that's me there was this kid julian darabeo he had a website like got jewels before there was like you know myspace or anything and he would put up pictures from parties on there and when i finally made it into one i felt like i'd made it oh man yeah this book is awesome pretty cool huh yeah 
I mean, all these people are just living. Yeah, they're just living. They're they preoccupied. they probably felt like their life was shitty then, and they probably thought before was better. Oh, I think so. But yeah, they, very much like that. Um, that uh, Midnight in Paris Midnight kind of vibe. Midnight in Paris vibe, yeah, where everyone's kind of n- lusting after the, the eras before then. Yeah, because we might have it made right now. I know. Don't. Isn't that scary? <laughs> but, it, yeah, we probably This do. might be as good as it gets. As it gets. Like... If you have a can of tuna in 20 years, you're just like, you know, this, you, you used to be able to just get these for like 99 cents. Well, that's how it goes, right? Like peasant food becomes like the the kind of uh, elite food yes. over a generation. Yes. I worked with a, a chef, a great chef, and he said like all great cuisine comes from scarcity and the creativity that is required to adapt to that scarcity and like, you know, yeah, keep things good even when they aren't. Yeah. Like oxtail, like that's like a, that's like every bougie restaurant, or like if you watch Top Chef or something, someone's always spinning that in there. But like that's can't be that's not the best part. No, of that's it. the end. That's yeah. the end of the animal. That's the shitty part. You get to the cul-de-sac of that ox, and uh, what's the best part of the ox? I think, um, like I think the front flank. Right? Yeah, it, I'm a big flank steak guy. Are you? Know? you? Yeah, I love it. Okay. It's good stuff. It, and an ox is different from a cow, right? I have no idea. Yeah, me neither. To me, an ox is a cow that's pulling something. Yeah, I think it's more labor intensive. It's more <laughs> muscular. Okay. Cows just kind of sit. They graze. <laughs> they graze. Ox are, you know, always moving forward. But, so it's the like sharks that quantum land physics animal. things where, like, you don't know if it's a wave or a particle until you open the box. That's so funny. I just interviewed a quantum physicist. I didn't understand a word of it. Yeah. No, I mean, that's that's the extent of my knowledge. Between right zero and one, there are waves. I was like, well, you're talking about two totally different things. Yeah. Zero and one. They can't even explain it. They can't. They're like, well, it's English's fault. They're Right. They're using numbers and words as, like, metaphors for something that they're talking about. But it don't fit right. No. I, I got to the end of it. I was just burnt out, oh, and I, you man. know, I don't even think, I don't even think quantum computing. I don't even think it's gonna, it's not gonna happen. Do you think he was burned out too? He was like sad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think they're using it for like encryption. I'm like, who gives a fuck about encryption? What's in? Oh, to hide. What yeah, you're like doing? like for password stuff. <laughs> this is this is where quantum physics is <laughs> is dovetailing. Like they're like, yeah. okay, well, we got to cordon you off to some kind of industry. So um, after we. We get the uh, particles, uh, you know, whatever, after we could finally see, split the atom or whatever. Yeah. Um, when they do your uh, calculator, sure you have no to pick like 40 pics. things. Yeah. Right. Jeez Louise. Yeah, I tried to in my early 20s read a few books on that, and it's just like, yeah, you, you can conceptualize whatever they give you a picture of, but you're not, you're not getting deeper into it. Than no, that. it's not going in. No, it's not going in. Um, well, what has gone in with you? I see you've got a nice stack of books here. I'm excited to get into them. I'm excited to see, yeah, where you're at in your reading life, what what you want to talk about, what you wanted to get off your shelf. So I guess I went chronologically, and some of them aren't with me, but, like, the first book that really impacted me was this book, and I can't find it anywhere. I couldn't even find it on Amazon when I was Googling it. I found it in my school's library when I was in eighth grade. It's called Crooked. It's about a girl with a crooked nose who's in junior high, and uh, her and this boy have a crush on each other, and he just lost his dad, who was a milkman. And the, the cover had a of just a milk, you know, like the milk jars that used to get delivered, and then a it's like very dark colors. And I read it, and it was so sensitive to how kids think. And I think it was written by a husband and wife, and uh, it was really smart about how like we're mean to each other to kind of become more popular mm-hmm. when you're that age, and how you kind of like things that are bad for you. And, and it was the first time I'd seen any of that, and it really like moved me. Yeah. No, I mean, to get those voices down when you're not even a kid anymore, is that's like a real special thing. It's crazy. They were probably in their 30s, 40s, and they were like drilling how my brain worked. And it was a husband and wife. I think so. Maybe almost like because as a couple, you like awaken all these early issues. In that's yourself. so true. You're just like, okay, you know how I got mad at you for that thing that I shouldn't have gotten mad at you for? Yeah. I think it's because when I was in high school... Um, you know, someone called me Joshy, and I didn't 
really want to be looked at as a Joshy at Dude, the time. So true. I that didn't have any to me and my pubic hair, all the time. but you know, it was like, yeah, just like yeah. that. That like l- you think you're done with the past. The past ain't done with <laughs> yeah. you. Yeah, I'll get insecure about some wild <laughs> shit, and I'll just pick a fight. And she's like, "What is going on here?" And I'm like, "Years and years of me fighting against that narrative, and you just confirmed it. And just ruined my life, and you're the person I'm hitched to. This is crazy." <laughs> oh. Yeah, I'm fighting ghosts, and you just happen to be the one I can see at the moment. Yeah, and I didn't know you were on their side. <laughs> like, so you agree with my seventh grade bully? You're that kind of person. Huh? My, I ended up becoming friends with like a guy who used to bully me on the bus, and he he like swears he didn't every time. Right. And I was a bad bully, but I've I've reached out to everyone and have like, you really? Yeah, yeah, I tried except for one person because I don't think they want to hear from me. But everybody else have been like, yeah, hey, sorry about that. Most people are very gracious about it too. But I mean, you're about my age. You're like in your thirties. Yeah, thirty six. Yeah, I'm th- okay. I'm older than you, thirty eight. Um, but like this American Bachelor book kind of brings you back. It's like that behavior was r- rewarded. It was a little more doggy dog in that era it was still coming out of this like i mean when your teachers are like vietnam vets and their parents are world war ii vets and like you know operation desert storage raging and whatever it's like kosovo kosovo Just don't keep don't conflict. discount com- <laughs> <laughs> fucking uh hiroshima nagasaki and all the rest of all that. that business in nicaragua and <laughs> <laughs> oh if you want to talk cia intervention we can go there too because i was feeling it even if i wasn't aware of it well the teachers had it in their bones somewhere <laughs> yeah and so you put that mix together yeah and it's, it did feel different than it does now which is it's a good thing that the world's growing up i think yeah I, I I was I turned I, I I didn't become nice till I was like 24. I kind of evolved a little bit, and yeah. then I was like, oh, I should actually. I think my life will work out better for me if I'm kind. Yeah. And right. for the most part, it did. But actually, now recently, I found myself trying to bring back some of that like junior high vengefulness and like combativeness that I had. Like I think I, I kind of need some. Kind of need right? some, right? Yeah, I think I might have gone too far. In yeah. The, the, I mean, it's a weird thing to like be grading. But what was your bully like? Now you guys are tight. Yeah, yeah, I was like a groomsman at his wedding. Whoa. I mean, he wasn't it wasn't anything severe. I just remember he was like making fun of me on the bus um like several times. And so then, yeah, one Halloween night I finally and we were like friends for years as adults and one Halloween night we were like on Molly and I finally was like, "Hey, Steven, just so you know, like you're my you were like my bully." Um, and he was like, I was not your bully. And then we just argued about it. And then you look out the window and it's broad daylight and you're like, what are we doing? <laughs> I got to go the home. Best nights. I got to go home that sounds, and pee on my bathroom floor awesome. and go to bed. Yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. You do. Um, yeah, no, it wasn't like super hardcore, but yeah, no, I feel like there's a couple pe- kids who probably like in middle school thought I was a bit of a bully. I, you know, looking back, it was just all that textbook stuff of not being able to take out your anger at home and being insecure and feeling left out i think it's the root of all like uh evil basically is feeling left out feeling left out yeah being away from the group and some people feel it even when they're not right just because they're so sensitive but i really do think that's the core of it yeah well and you were saying then at 24 you realized things would turn out better for you if you were nice it's also just like what behavior gets incentivized And then, yeah, you go through, you're like, I think being nice is actually just going to like make things easier for me, like in a very selfish way. Yeah. And then you you get further into like your life and the business world and certain relationships have time to get further down the road. And you're like, okay, actually, so there are limits to this thing in the way society's shaped right now, especially in like the business world. Totally. Like you have your values and then you have the drives of the capitalist engine. And those two things, they want you to be able to do both but yeah there's a lot of gray area with them yeah and i've tried to argue like hey we should all be being nicer to each other but that's like it doesn't always like move people you know so sometimes you got to be able to just be like listen you piece of shit motherfucker (laughs) (laughs) i I think you know what it really is it's not being one or the other it's having access to both i think is the important thing yeah being able to like draw on the angry part of yourself in a functional way and also be able to draw on the kind part of yourself when compassion is needed it's like uh it is some Star Wars shit. Yeah, yeah, it really is to like recognize that moment 
when one should be called upon or the other when you're going to use the force. But they have momentum. If you start being angry, then you, you, your brain goes there quicker, and then it's like, go angry. And then afterwards, you're like, oh, I shouldn't have yelled at my dad that time. Like, I was right to yell at I him know. two weeks ago. Right. But this time, I'm because this literally just happened. You used the yell card. You <laughs> yeah. pulled out your yell card, and it just wasn't. No, I was like, that wasn't a yell card moment. Yeah. Yeah, but it happens. Ocean Avenue. <clears throat> I, I've started surfing a bunch uh, this year again, hadn't in a while, and I hit my head in the water a couple days in a row and immediate headache, but I was like, oh, I'll just go again and I'll try not to hit my head. And I did. And I definitely felt foggy. And then, <clears throat> yeah, I ended up like getting in a fight with this personal trainer at the park near my house because his dog was like a little too aggressive near my little dog. And, you know, I just walked away just kind of like so embarrassed by having lost my cool. Also, like, I'm, like, holding a poodle under my arm, yelling at a personal trainer. I was like, I got to move from Santa Monica. This is – I'm turning – if someone caught this Can on I video so? I love right that now. for you. Really? Yeah. I think okay. you're living. You're alive. Okay. And you're living without shame. Yeah. There was a little shame. Though. Afterwards? After. That's normal. Okay. And then I'm sitting down at this coffee shop near it, and this woman walks by who I guess had heard it, and she just goes, we love our dogs. <laughs> see, I think I think that's another thing. I think conflict leads to a lot of connection, right? Because okay. people see you as yourself, unprotected, and they feel close to you as a result. Yeah, there it is. Like when I was yelling at my dad, we went outside my girlfriend's place, and I was in his face, and we were yelling. And then my neighbor was there, and afterwards I had to go talk to him, and it really kind of bonded us. He's like, "No, I get it." And I was like, <laughs> in that moment, I was like, "Oh, he's had fights with his dad, or wanted to have fights yeah. with his dad," and we it kind of. Whoa, yeah. Yeah, we're like, we're more eye to eye now. Yeah, sort of healthy conflict. Because you and your dad didn't like throw blows. No, my dad says I was going to, but I wasn't. No. No, he's just trying to pin me down as some kind of monster. Yeah. But he knows for a fact. Yeah. <laughs> he knows for a fact. <laughs> I would not punch you, dad. I would not. I, I have in the past, but it's okay. it, we're past that point. Yeah. yeah. No, that's, uh, it's called, it's just growing up. So the guy, the personal trainer, were you right? I, yeah, I feel I was right. But, and you know how I've, I think I'm right is because even to this day, I won't walk past that park now because I'm like, I'm mad about how he didn't, he was a personal trainer who didn't take accountability, which is like the worst thing you could have in you a gotta personal trainer. You got to have accountability. Trainer. His dog, I do not blame at all. It was a friendly dog, just much bigger than mine. This guy is always at this park. He lets his dog off the leash. It's a small park, so you basically can't use the park. And so his dog pounces on mine. And I'm like, hey, can you just get your dog under control? It, your dog just hurt my dog. He goes, how do you know it hurt your dog? Did he tell you? Okay. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I'm, I'm this big swinging dick. Cause I'm, I, dude, I was getting mad as you were talking about it. Okay. And my dog is 13 pounds, like couldn't harm a fly. We're ha I'm, my brother and his new girlfriend are there too. That's the other part. So I'm with my brother. And yeah, just kind of, yeah, I just, I called him a yuppie. I called him all these names. You got to hit him where it hurts and you yeah. got to give him something to think about. Something to think about. Yeah. And I, I definitely like engaged his clients. <laughs> you know, yeah, I was good. Like, oh, why don't you guys park some more cars here? You know, and yeah. like, yeah, not my proudest moment, but I have had things like this in, in my past where it's like, yeah, I feel like I get to a point where I'm backed into a corner enough that I do kind of explode and I have this booming voice when I do. Yeah, and you're a big dude. Big dude. Yeah. It's all a bluff, but we're all blowfish. Yeah. But I think it's important that this guy's coming to the park and here's my thing. If you're going to act like a big swinging dick, whether you're aware of it or not, like you're taking up all this space, you're bringing all these people, you're definitely making us all like kind of orient around your behavior. Well, then you got to be ready for people to come at you and you can't really play victim in that moment because right. you've decided to take up all this space. That's right. And then he kind of, yeah, yeah, you can't, you can't have it both ways. Yeah, and that's what that I didn't guy, like be that about. guy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I know. I feel that way in this world too, where I'm like, I respect people who, okay, I don't agree with them. I don't think the world's going to be in a better place necessarily because of them. But like, I respect people who, who kind of own their evil more than yeah. I do the people who are pretending to be good and still committing evil. Yeah. It's just one less step. Yeah, of evil in the process. It's crazy how far self-awareness goes. Right. Where you could be like the worst person in the world, but if you're like, yeah, I'm kind of a piece of shit, I'm like, yeah, but you're a real dude. <laughs> yeah, but you're my piece I'm of like, shit. I'm like, but you're a real you know? dude. Yeah, <laughs> no one could take that from me. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, I could get into all this sort of disenchantment with politics at this point, but I'd rather hear about the books you brought. Well, maybe we'll get there. Yeah, it's maybe a, we oh, will. Oh, you know what? Let's skip then, because, boom. JFK. Politician. Yes. But Canada. it's his early years. This is like, this ends right when he was like uh, elected, it's so funny, uh, governor or senator. I think it was senator. But uh, it's it's his early life, and uh, so I kind of went books that have affected me at different time periods and, and now Love I'm it. firmly in like my old white guy phase where I, I don't really read novels anymore I just read biographies of great men yeah and, and I believe in great men <laughs> and and this one I think of all those is my favorite JFK he's just so inspiring he's just if like if you have like your creative player attributes he's like a hundred on like ten of them really and then, yeah and just he's like a zero as a faithful husband but everything else he's like a hundred right he's so smart he's so brave He's so inspiring. He's so tenacious. I just, uh, I, I was totally moved by it. I bought in hook, line, and sinker. Wow. Wow. Yeah, because, I mean, you know you you know what you know about JFK, but unless you delve into it, I really don't know that much. I know he came from a prominent family, but he was very much for your average person, and uh, the CIA killed him. Exactly. So I haven't gone to the CIA killing him. Right, because this ends before he even becomes president. Yeah, and I and I'm, I grew up spoiled, so not not to his level. But the great part about war was it was this great equalizer where he got to prove himself independent of all that. And you know he he kind of saved his crew. Their little U boat went down, and he like dragged one guy with his teeth, like pulled the guy's what? life vest by his teeth, what? and they swam like a mile to some island, and then he went for a swim into like you know the unforgiving ocean to try and find help and ended up getting his crew saved no way. and then he wrote a book that won like the nobel peace prize about politicians who go against their own party i mean he had a bunch of nurses writing it for him right this is when his back was all he had this is post problems. world war ii yeah and he went against his dad his dad was like for germany and then jfk was like no 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 germany's a problem and uh yeah he was just kind of a just a cool dude and then like chicks really liked him which yeah. i think is also very compelling yeah i mean to be desired in yeah. our society there's like a big uh value on that so he like tug i was thinking he tugs the guy in by his teeth and then he swims back out to like maybe try to meet some local women <laughs> and then he comes they were back. all taken with right. him so they came over on their canoes they grabbed him and they, like, they saved we were ready teeth. to spy for america yeah and it just had some good it's beautifully written it had some good quotes in there like uh he used the attributes of the weak, which is cunning and audacity. And uh, that really stuck with me. He, he like, views the attributes of the weak? No, he used, so because he he, his body was kind of compromised. It said he used the, the the tools of the weak, which is cunning and audacity. And Whoa. I was like, oh, yeah. Whoa. That is, yeah, if you got those, you got a shot. The audacity is just like like having a huge view of what you can do in the world. Yeah, and just going for it. Yeah, and people being magnetized by that. Exactly. And that was the other thing. People were just so magnetized by him. For whatever it was, maybe it's just like lore, but something was in him that captivated people. It did, huh? And his homies talk about it. Like, they're just like, yeah, he like moved outside of time. It was like, they, the way they talk about it was like, Jesus Christ. Can you imagine if you had a friend like that that you just like revered? Maybe, do you? Do you have a JFK in your life? You know, I don't know if I'm a good enough person where I could handle being around that all right. the time. Right. It, it might make me feel too bad, it, and it might it, make me be like, I'd rather try and be my own. JFK. Yeah, and even if I fail, yeah, I find more fulfillment in that. So you, I, so you like true ego identification with JFK. You're like, I see some of these traits, and I can grow. Yeah, those within it's myself. totally aspirational. You know, I do kind of feel that way actually about Chad. You do. Mm -hmm, where he's he moves me in ways all the time, just through his work ethic and his. Uh, he's very kind. I've never seen him be like mean to someone. And I've known him for like a decade, so wow. I'm always blown away by that, just how like gentle he is with people. Yeah. And kind of above the pettiness that a lot of people are in. But then yeah. he still works really hard. So it's, it's an interesting combo. I mean, especially in the comedy world. A yeah. lot of people are drawn to it out of a certain inferiority. And so there's a lot of jealousy and whatever. Totally. And this need to be heard. And you feel like if someone else is heard, you're not heard. I mean, I'm guilty of it. No, totally. Yeah. I am so too. to hear someone in that world who isn't is pretty cool and he's still really ambitious while simultaneously not being like no less for you less for you it's 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 cool that so yeah he's cool. probably the closest um but yeah this book rip shit yeah it sounds it's awesome it sounds awesome i mean just yeah you, i'm just racking my brain for like who are those compelling figures now and we just don't have them at the moment i like when obama happened in that yeah. first moment when he kind of 
took the stage and he was such a great speaker and so inspiring and he had all the right slogans behind him. I mean, I think we had a moment where we really believed in like, okay, maybe things are turning here. It caught me at the wrong time where I was very cynical about it. Oh, really? I was like, oh, it's all celebrity. But then looking back on it, I'm like, oh, I should have enjoyed it more. It was enjoyed kind of a more. nice moment. Because ultimately now he's the Netflix producer. So Dude, you, bumps you were me right. so hard. <laughs> <laughs> Did you read his book? Um, I read The Audacity of Hope, like, but not not the new one. Like, I, this is like in, what, 08? Yeah. When he was running, I read that book. I read the new one. It's too long. Is it? That's my big review. There we go. Like needed more action. He talks too I, much. I mean, it. the fact that JFK has like action in his in his biography, yeah, shit's happening. like it is an action film. And they're moving around a lot. Like his family's in Europe. His sister's dating like a prince. It's oh, it's a uh, glorious. Yeah, it's glorious. Okay. Um, and then this book is the one that hit me the hardest in high school. It was, again, I picked it up in the library when I was in detention, and he's one of my all time heroes. It's Roger Ebert, The Great Movies, and it's just his reviews of like the best movies ever. Roger Ebert was such a compelling writer. The best. A lot of a lot of empathy. Yeah, a lot of empathy. He wrote this piece shortly before he passed away that I like saved because it was just so touching and so aware of life and what we're doing while we're living. Um, just kind of amazing. Like a film critic has had had the talent himself. Yeah, it's called Death Itself, right, or something like that. Oh, so yeah, so they made. Is that? Oh, the that's name the, of documentary, the documentary. Maybe. That's yeah. yeah. But I, I know the essay you're talking about. Where he's talking about, I'm not afraid to die. I wasn't afraid yes. to be born. Something about a train to somewhere. He's taking a train to ruin or, or some French <laughs> place. He probably spent some time in that yeah. I haven't and can't pronounce. No, that really moved me. That was when I was like, oh, this guy is just like someone who inspired me to get into like movies and art. To like, I was like, oh no, he's like teaching me how to live a little bit. Right. And so in that book, the great movies, did it uncover some that you went and watched or did it kind of con ex expand your thoughts about ones you'd already seen? Yeah, I think it, it totally gave me stuff to go watch. Like I, I saw like uh, Do the Right Thing because of this, Body Heat, um, Taxi Driver. A lot. I learned a lot about older films and then learned a lot about it's like that thing when you first start reading, you, it connects you to other things that you then read. Yes. And this was like one of the big touchstone ones that way where it like. I didn't know what like why Battleship Potemkin was important. I didn't know why Citizen Kane was important. And even if I never like grew to like love those things, he just gave me context. Exactly. And, and so the Bella de Jour, about a I, I've seen it. Yeah, about a French woman who becomes a prostitute. Yeah. The, especially the sexual stuff was very exciting to me. That's cool. Because I lived in kind of a uh, conservative place, but I could tell everybody was horny. And <laughs> and then he was just drilling all these movies where it's like, yeah, everybody is horny, and it's, and it's art. It's art to be horny. <laughs> And I was like, nice, good. Um, <laughs> yeah, JFK, Hoop Dreams. And yeah, he he just is a beautiful writer. And then it gave me a good, like, uh, I don't know. It gave me a good rubric of stuff to go go check out. That's cool. Some people theorize that, like, conservative culture is, like, a fetish to, ex like, make the horniness more fun. I 100% like, agree. Like, isn't that the thing? Victorian culture, they were dressing up that way intent and abiding by all these rules to create kink everywhere they looked I, I don't know if that's it like resonates historically accurate but it resonates like right? i think some people want it to be they want sex to be a bad thing that makes them like nut harder <laughs> right. so like rather than being like hey we're poly and it's all okay and it's all worked out and ethical they're like no no the point is that <laughs> it's unethical is that we act like superheroes in our day-to-day -day, and then we fly to mexico and do just unspeakable things <laughs> yeah because if you've ever been to like a uh, hot springs where everyone's naked and, and or like some alternative event like that where no one's wearing clothes it's like the least sexual it's thing. boring it's like very pure and lo and heart centric but yeah it's not necessarily like um yeah er erotic really it, it's it's erotic on a frequency that's way too low for everything we've been exposed to i guess yeah it's almost childlike when you're in that kind of, you're just a kind of free yeah but you're not like looking to get down no but but it, and i think there's also something where like I think we're attracted to people who can compartmentalize it very well, almost like that lady in the streets freaking the sheets, like aphorism. Like if you really dig into it, what we like about that is that someone can be so one way, but like they're so good at hiding this right. other powerful part of themselves. A transformation occurs. Yeah, maybe that has like a societal 
power where they're like, oh, you know, this person's like, they can move me forward a little they're bit. They're a good liar. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> lying about things is, yeah, is lying very is valuable. <laughs> like that Panic at the Disco song <laughs> title. Or the, that's a, it's a quote from that movie, Closer, Play Closer. Do you remember the quote? Yeah, it's like, it's so, yeah, I love it. I'm not even going to say it's yep. something that it's, that's like, I'm not going to say it's corny because it's not corny. It's good. It's uh, lying's the most fun a girl can have without taking her clothes off. <laughs> and does Natalie Portman say that or Julia yeah. Roberts? I think Natalie Portman says it when she's flirting with Clive Owen after they both get cheated on. Nice. Yeah. Lying is the most fun a girl could have without taking her clothes off. And I would say for guys, it's pretty close too. Yeah, there's a thrill to lying. I don't ever do it. I don't ever lie either. It sucks. I wish I did did it more. I, I do. Mean, I know, do once in a while. I'll lie once in a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but sure. I, but I'm fairly honest. And if I do lie, I toward, in like a week or two, I'll be like, yeah, actually. I need yeah. to reveal something. Is But I don't think it's actually out of a... I think it's simpler is one of the reasons I do it. Same. And and but the the biggest reason I do it is the times I have been caught lying, I've felt like I had the least leverage in whatever conversation I was in, and I've felt the most humiliated. Right. So it's like a, a defense against getting back to that feeling ever. Yeah. Because the the reward is not worth the sh the shame of those experiences. I think that's probably the same for me. Yeah, it just sucks. Yeah. Yeah. I don't get a lot. And I also like I had a lot of siblings growing up, so my other thing is being accused of something I didn't do is like that's one I really don't like. Why does that give it get us so mad? <sighs> yeah, maybe it's because it's like you didn't even get me for the thing I did do. And the lack of faith. Yeah, the lack of faith. And the fact that your word can only go so far with a person if they're convinced otherwise, that's like almost like maybe a symbol of the human condition, right? Totally. I, the, the worst I ever felt is when I, I was living such a shitty life, I was telling my mom the truth and she didn't believe me. And I was like, whoa, I have really eroded trust here. Because I was like, no, I'm telling you the truth. She's like, I don't believe you. I was a like, man, a shitty life go. like in high school or your early 20s? No, I was in like my late 20s, but I was just partying like crazy and just doing a bunch of stupid shit. And uh, yeah, just like my parents were like, dude, we just do not trust you because you're so out of control. And I was like, whoa, interesting. And you had been telling them something that wasn't out of control and they didn't even believe I was telling it. them the truth. I was like, no, I didn't do that thing. This is actually what's been going on. And they were like, no, yeah, we don't believe you. And wow. I was like, whoa, okay. Wow. Yeah. I but you up. feel like you kind of earned that one a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that wasn't their fault. Well, for me, I was a kid and my parents on one of the top bookshelves had the joy of sex. And one of my other siblings had taken it down and like looked at it. It's like a 70s illustrated book on sex my mom found it and just like beeline toward me it was it was she thought i was the one who took it down it wasn't a big deal but josh you can't be looking at this and i was just to the point of tears because i was like i i didn't do it you know oh, i didn't do it that's beautiful yeah i didn't do it yeah and so sex has been joyless ever since good no no <laughs> better that way <laughs> <laughs> Sounds no, interesting. Yeah, no, it was just a yeah, a pretty formative feeling. Yeah, and so I think actually for me the fear is like lying will only increase those scenarios. Yeah. yeah. It's just easier to keep track of the truth. Yeah, you're just like, no, I just tell the truth. That's yeah. it. Yeah, I'll just and not benefit. I'll omit details. That's probably the worst I'll do. That's right. Yeah, I'll give like the like a feeling of truth, but I've, I've massaged some of the corners. <laughs> That's in a just bit. editing. <laughs> <laughs> just making it digestible for yeah, the exactly. audience. I'm, not, I'm just trying not to waste time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with the details just that might make me look bad. Just laughing time yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if I come out looking like a better person as a result, well, that's kind of what you wanted anyway. Yeah. We're all better for it. Yeah. No one's being harmed in this. Mm -hmm. um, should I go to the next yeah, one? Yeah, I would love to hear it. I, I love what you've brought so far. So this one is... Um, this one didn't change how I thought about life at all, but it's just the coolest stuff ever. Like, I think he's my favorite writer to read. I can just pound one of his books in like a day. And they do have more depth than I think he's given credit for because he has a pretty kind of like cynical outlook on people, but it's very fun. Like everyone's betraying each other. Everyone's doing crazy stuff, but they're they're just acting on instinct and it's exciting. And it's uh, Elmore Leonard's Cuba Libre. And I think this is his best book because it's, it's got a lot of history in it so you can learn a ton too. But... He's most famous for like uh, the books he wrote that got turned into big movies like Jackie Brown, Get Shorty, uh, Out of Sight, the Justified TV series, like all of his books. just And, and I think his best books actually haven't been turned into movies yet. But uh, yeah, this one for me is top. And everyone is just so cool. So cool. They talk so cool. They're all smooth. How do, how do some people channel that? He just has to be cool, right? Yeah, I mean, I've seen him in interviews and he's like, doesn't seem like, 
one of his characters. But yeah, I think he would be a great guy to hang out with. Yeah. Like he doesn't say more than's necessary. He's very simple in his approach to writing. He had like 10 rules and it was like only use a period or a comma for like punctuation. Like he was like against like semicolons and stuff like that, which oh, I nice. thought was cool. That takes the pressure off. Yeah, right. Still don't quite understand semicolons no matter how many times I look it up. Dude, exactly. And uh, yeah, and I just like the way. That's great when you become f- successful enough. It's something that you can just cover up your, your like blind spots by making rules. Totally. Like I... don't use semicolons. I don't actually know how they work, but don't use them. <laughs> because I don't understand them. They're dumb. Yeah. I think Orson Welles said, like, let your limitations be your style. And yes, uh, th- this guy, more style than anybody. I love that. Yeah, because he's really well known for, like, L.A. noir and, like, Western. And yeah, it's did all he, pulpy. Did he write L.A. Confidential? I don't think so. I think that was James Elroy. James Elroy, okay. But uh, he, he's a little not as – those ones, like, have, like, a broodingness to them. And he's not brooding. Like, okay. he's it's all badass dudes, but they're all very light. Yeah. And – uh and yeah, I just, I always feel like I'm better at, you know, when you read like a book and it rewires your brain to the author a little bit. Yeah. This one, I feel like I talk cooler to people after I read. No like, kidding. Yeah. Like I'm like snappier. Cuba Libre. Yeah. Good one. Okay. Good one. Well, I got to read it now too. Cause I want to, I want some pithy one liners. Dude, you'll be, yeah. Like uh, you walk into someone will like steal your cowboy hat and you're like, Hey, that's a 10 gallon hat <laughs> on a 20 gallon head. <laughs> like, this guy's, this guy's fucking... that, that reminds me of a book I read last night that made me cry. This book, Erosion, by Terry Tempest Williams, I came across this line of hers. Her brother is in his 50s. He commits suicide. She writes this incredibly touching piece where she goes to, she even, her and her brother, they witness his cremation, which is like so intense. But then she she says, and we'll get to the part that relates to the 10-gallon hat in the most non-cool way, but... She says, Dan's ashes weighed eight pounds, seven ounces, the same weight as when he was born. Whoa. Fuck. And then this, the line after That's that good. is, it is also the weight of a gallon of water one carries in the desert. Yeah, so like th- for three to five seconds, I just lost it. I just started crying, and then it stopped. That's beautiful. Yeah, but the 10-gallon hat reminded me of it. And yeah, so beautiful. Our beginning, our end, our salvation, all there in like a couple sentences. couple sentences. And you know, there's parts in here where I'm like, oh, would I even like this woman if I met her in real life? She's like a hardcore environmentalist. Um, but you know, she's basically talking about how personal and environmental grief are one and the same, where, who we are and our environment and how we treat it is how we treat ourselves and what we lose is inherent in, you know, life, but also as we sort of pervert life and nature and stuff it it sort of skews how we've handled grief um and so yeah anyway i just feel like i found this book at exactly the right time how'd you find it so that's the crazy part i i've been touring i'm trying to visit all 73 of the la public library locations I saw this. yeah and make videos about it and i think my fourth or fifth i went to the westwood library branch and they have a one dollar used book sale cart came across it read a few lines but leading up to it, I'd had this weird thing at the beginning and end of this year, 2023 into 2024, where I kept hearing owls. Like I'd see them in trees in my neighborhood. They show, Two of them showed up like a block away. They were living in the palm trees. Went up to Santa Cruz um, for Christmas, and I saw an owl on, on a telephone line, and it flew off right after I got off the phone with my sister. My dad used to always collect owls. Then I bought my girlfriend this book on symbols, and it, I've talked about this, I think, on the podcast already, but it's, um, she looked up owls, and it was like, it's, they mean like death and rebirth to most cultures, and then like the Inuits are like, owls are kind of like spirit guides, and I was like, okay, let's go with theirs. Death <laughs> and rebirth sounds a little heavy, uh, but then, you know, I flip open this woman's book, and like the first chapter, it's it's something like, uh it's called like the question of owl the question held by owls and i'm like yeah i really feel like this book found me interesting yeah really interesting so owls just are like a that's like the motif of your life at least it was december january i feel like i'm coming out of the owl phase i'm glad to be Uh, but it's also cool when you can sort of even in this sort of modern life kind of understand that like yeah nature's still speaking to you 
Yeah, that the natural part's always right there if it, you pay attention. Right there, even even in a even if we obstruct it, it's still there. That's right. Well, and she was saying how like rock faces they measured from the bottom of this rock face to the top, and it they emit noise on like a certain frequency, and that like when helicopters fly over these surfaces, there's a noise that humans can't even hear that like actually disturbs the environment. And so just that there's all these interactions that are happening that we don't even pick up on a sensory level. But does nature care or is it, or is it our like, does it bother us because we feel like it would bother nature? Right, we're like ego identifying. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of that. Yeah, because like if, no matter how bad we fuck it up, like I feel like it's still gonna, it's gonna be okay, but we're gonna be the ones who right. are like, can't hang anymore. And yeah. like a lot of other critters. It seems like it has a response, right? And it's like, this is just what, okay, nature will respond. That's but why yeah. I like malls, because malls will go away one day. But, like, I know the mountains will always be there. Yeah, so malls are more precious in a way. Totally. Like, when I go to the Grove, I'm like, this is... Soak this in. Yeah, soak this in, because this, <laughs> this will not <laughs> this will not last well, much longer. things like the Grove are fascinating, because they measure... They simulate what walking through a city without cars would be. And then... But they, like, they're... I don't know if you've read about it. Like they'll study what's the ideal curb height for a pedestrian. Let's put in a curb and and they'll find it. I didn't it. know that, but I could feel it. When you I'm can there. feel it because it's so perfectly it's so like, ideal. It's perfect. Yeah. No, I love being at the Grove and the the Americana, and I would hang out at the one I'm in Westlake. Caruso West head. Yeah, Caruso head. Yeah, you, the Commons in Calabasas. The Westlake Promenade was near my high school. I would ditch school and go to the Barnes and Noble there. The Barnes and Nobles at the, I mean, three stories, they got good areas to sit. I've said it when you like grow up in the suburbs, that feels like you're in Paris. Totally. Like, <laughs> I used to steal books. Me too. Just for the rush. Yeah. And, from Barnes and Noble. And you don't even have to, cause they got like a two week return policy as long as it's unread. <laughs> okay. So you're just, you're just making a library out of, out of Barnes and Noble. <laughs> yeah. All theoretical. Of course, this is for entertainment. We're not saying we did it. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and then, all right, should I get to my last one? Yeah, yeah, let's hear it. So it's not this one, but I do like this book a lot because it's just about being selfish. Great. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Um, Once again, just kind of leaning into it. Yeah. Well, well and it kind of comes back on the dude in the end. Like there is some karma for there's, it. There's a moral. But, but I think I read it when I was about the protagonist age and I was like, oh, yeah. There's something about when life is really easy for you and everything's working out for you that you just don't care much what happens to other people because you feel like it's supposed to work out that way almost yeah yeah the the ability to like feel empathy that's like a learned that's you're born with it but there's also some experiences that definitely fast forward the learning on it yeah and like whatever track you're on in life can kind of accelerate it too or, or decelerate but but I, actually i don't have his stuff here and maybe i'm sure he's going to get brought up a lot if it's people of a certain age but i, I was going to go with david foster wallace i want to talk about david foster wallace we haven't talked about him at all on this uh i want to say one more thing to your subject yeah. on on joe college is like in reading selfish books when you're young i didn't like understand politics or propaganda in my 20s i still don't but you know i, I at least have an awareness and so I just would always see Ayn Rand books everywhere, like Atlas Shrugged. It looked really big. And I was like, oh, I bet you have to read this because it's really big. And The Fountainhead. And so I just like read both of those books with like no idea that there was like a political bent to them. Right. But they were kind of encouraging you to be selfish just on surface level. I didn't understand that she was saying, hey, societally, we should all be libertarians or whatever it is um but I, I just thought there was something really funny about like reading these books and not piecing together the propaganda in any way i was like oh that's a story have you seen the adam curtis documentary that kind of has a chunk about her no well she was like having an affair with someone who was like in her like little thinker salon and she kept telling the dude she's like, he was married she's like you gotta leave your wife because that is what the objectivist philosophy wants you to do <laughs> and so she had totally taken all of her like theories and just like 100 percent makeshifted them to this dude and was like bro you gotta you gotta be with me are we really all just like seeing how far our cult can go in the world mm -hmm. and like it either gets rejected or we get to take our cult a little further yeah you know, that's a like, good way of describing life you know she's like let's see if this objective philosophy thing plays in my own and when you have kids love life. that's what you're doing you're like are these kids gonna buy into what i'm selling right yeah do you have kids 
I just had two. Yeah, they're six months old. No way. Twins. Twins. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay, so yeah, you're on that train of thought. Yeah, because because I've I've taken in so much with my parents, Tommy, and I've rejected a lot of it. But more, but I'm totally stamped by them. Yeah. But uh, I look at my kids sometimes. I'm like, oh, you're gonna like really reject half of what I tell you and like hate me at certain points, and that's just how it goes. And you might be right for some of. Yeah, you'd be totally right, and there'll be blind spots that I'm just, ignorant to that I walk around thinking above, and then you're gonna point them out to me and throw it in my face. Yeah, well, and then that's just it, right? And then how you take in that information from them is kind of the. I guess that's a big moment for me. Yeah, am I gonna be like, shut up, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or am I gonna be like, hmm, and I'm probably both. Both, you'd be like, shut up, okay, wait. <laughs> Because yeah. they probably do deserve a little. Sh- I, I right. certainly deserve some shut up. Yeah, we all do. I mean that. But someone, yeah, I mean that, that's kind of a perfect segue to David Foster Wallace because there's a lot of re- revisionist history on him. A lot yeah. of people who, who kind of write him off now as like a certain caricature of intellectual bro who was just as toxic as everyone else. Whatever. I read Infinite Jest when I was in my mid twenties. So right, so right at the time when all the dudes were reading it. Um, I read a few of his other books. I, of course, at the time I really loved them, and I found him so funny. The, I haven't and the coolest kind him. of funny, like smart and dumb at the same time, and yes. just walking in lockstep and surprising you. Yes, there was a, like his book, The Broom of the System. I remember reading. I'm just reading along, and then like you're like a third of the way in, and he's talking about a character seeing the sweeping black sands of the Ohio desert. And like, I just burst into laughter because he just like created this magical, realist, absurd moment where there's a big black sand desert in Ohio. And it just came, it like, it just hit me out of the The blue. timing of the it. The timing, and I, I just was cracking up out loud. It, it is, it's crazy, because yeah, I think he had a profound influence on the way like I wanted to think, where I was like, oh, it'd be cool to have a brain like his. And I, I was like, when I'd read him, I just felt like I was learning or laughing on every page. But then totally, I read like the biography of him, which people think went too like soft on him now. I think the biography is pretty every rough on him. Every love story is a ghost story. Yeah, the yeah, DT Max one. And I, after I read it, I was like, no, this dude's a psycho. Like it, it definitely shook up the kind of kindness that he would project in interviews and stuff. And uh, and now, yeah, he's kind of like a punch, which happens to, I guess, all the people who get to that level of success. You yes. know, at a certain point, people just associate you with like, your annoying followers or whatever your worst crimes but and, and, yeah their worst crimes their lives end up getting moralized so yeah. they're like okay now we need to apply today's morality to when they were alive or even their morality to when they were alive and feel like diminish them a bit or something and and, it, and, and the, the books are i haven't reread them in a while but they were the at that point i was like there's no one i like more than this guy and and uh and he kind of same time because when you're in your 20s you are trying to learn how to live i was like no he's teaching me how to approach the world so which book of his in particular you know probably the the, the not is the, probably the nonfiction ones like oh yeah consider the lobster a supposedly fun thing i'll never do again yeah there was i did like the girl with the curious hair like there was little passages in there but i kind of did prefer him describing real life well and he had that famous talk about the fish and yeah the this, water, is water. this is water and yeah, the other fish going, what? what's that, you know? Um, and yeah, you're right. Like he did sort of speak to a certain like, okay, life is shitty, but here's how you sort of try to dig your way through. Um, and a so supposedly fun thing I'll never do again, this, the story, the title story about his time on the cruise ship. Amazing. Yeah, and just all the things he was speaking to, like, okay, take it or leave it. You know, this could mark me as a whatever, a bro lit guy but like infinite jest was initially titled infinite jest a failed entertainment he was writing it in a style to bludgeon you with anti-entertainment and the core of the story is there's a tape that you get in the mail that is so satisfying to you when you watch it you're rendered comatose and in a diaper and it's like man how far are we from that with these google these apple goggles and Netflix started sending you DVDs in the mail, and now you don't even need to go to your mailbox. It's all here. And yeah, he was right. He was right, and I'm sure other people were thinking it. At the and other time people too were probably right it. too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's not to say he's he not the only one. This sole visionary. No, but he did a good job of packaging it and making it fun and entertaining and and soulful. Yeah. But and then I, it was funny. You, you not funny actually, but coincidental because you talked about the suicide in there. And one of the favorite things. 
because he had that really nasty relationship with Mary Carr where I think he like pulled a gun on her and she was like, you know, he was showing up at her house and being like a lunatic. And her poem that she wrote about him after he died is like my favorite poem ever because it's so she looks so sideways at his pain. She just sees it as like ego and like mm. uh, pretension almost. Mm. And she says like every forgive me for thinking like every suicide's an asshole. Wow. And she kind of just even. <laughs> Wait, I mean, she was there, so she's totally valid in her feelings. And she's a really it. good writer. So, yeah, she is. So it's like it hits. She kind of like she's looking down on him a little bit while I was like looking up to him. So I, I like reading that too. And just seeing, and it kind of convinced me in a way I was like, yeah, he was kind of a, not a great dude, but the books mean a lot to me. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, and I'm trying, I think we're all grappling as we know so much about every person now grappling with how to take in conflicting art in that way. Yeah. So it's an interesting conversation and one I think that's ongoing. And yeah, also the other thing is like revisiting, like, I remember those Gen X authors when I was in my early 20s. They were so hard to find at used bookstores. And now every book sale, there's a David Foster Wallace, Girl with right. the Curious Hair copy, all the Juno Diaz books, because I loved him at the time, too. Sure. And then I, I flipped one open the other day in the library book sale, and I was like, oh, no. You, 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 okay, His this, books did rip, though. They when you were twenty two and yeah. thought like that's the way the world was and looked, and that romance was just sort of walking the thin line between being an asshole and like a charismatic dude or whatever. And maybe I'm more forgiving of Foster Wallace because he's dead. Because he's dead. Yeah, I, if you know he, Diaz died, I'd probably read Drown again or something, or right. Brief Wondrous, and be like, oh yeah, it's it's all right. Yeah, I know, and then that adds the com the layer there too. I mean, hearing you talk about Mary Carr's poem makes you think even further on it. But it's like, yeah, I'm being generous. Yeah. Did I'm Did you say. read? I guess the other one who has kind of sur seems like he was a decent dude, as far as we know, is that George Saunders. George he, Saunders. Yeah, he's another yeah. big one from that kind of group that mm -hmm. I'm like. He kind of when, when I read his stuff, I was just like, I couldn't even get through the whole thing because I'd get so sad. But yeah. He's one of my favorites, and he seems, by all accounts, as generous of a person as he probably is. He seems cool. He seems cool. We'll see what happens. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Give it time. <laughs> but, man, yeah, I, I had a feeling I'd enjoy this conversation, and I enjoyed it even more. Oh, good. Uh, me too, man. I was so excited to come in and talk about this stuff. It's fun. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming in, and, uh, yeah, I feel better for it. So, JT Parr. Oh, thanks, man. Josh, thanks Turek. Pleasure. Honor. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you.